I don't really like doing this anyway. Okay. Um, can are you can you hear okay? Fine. Fine. Okay, without the mic. Okay. Okay. Today we're going to talk about uh, sports in Shakopee. And you know it's kind of interesting because well, of course I didn't actually do the presentation until yesterday, so it's like last minute, which is kind of normal. But I also was like I had been gathering materials and reading stuff for the past month. And there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. So what I'm going to show you is just a very small part of what we have. And I just basically just picked a few things that I thought were kind of interesting to me. And you know, there could be much, there's much more out there, so just so you know. Um, I like this picture specifically because this was 1904. And this was the basketball team from Shakopee. What's interesting is because, well, not only there are outfits, which I'm sure were probably look probably just like what they probably have on now, but you know, even how they uh, <coughs> played um, basketball and just like any other sports were very different for both men and women, and that was definitely true. I remember my mom, even when she was growing up, they would play kitten ball. The, the girls would play kitten ball while the boys were playing baseball or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's just kind of the way it is. But I just want to talk about a few things. And we'll start with the, lap, the earliest picture we have of Shakopee. This was in 1852. It was a drawn by um, Robert Sweeney. And he was playing a golf of uh, what is called um, what we call lacrosse. And this was the Dakota Indians, and they were playing on the prairie in Shakopee. In other words, where all the houses are, probably, is where this is going on. And they actually used to say that the, um, the ball play that used to play at this time was both for men and women. They'd be separately as two different groups. And they would um, play against other teams in the area. Um, they say that it's probably about 400 years old that they've been playing uh, in, and in Shakopee, probably the same time also, in the 1600s is when they first started doing it. And it was a way that they even still used to teach people about cultures, values, and life skills. Um, and it's interesting because lacrosse is now here in Shakopee again for both uh, men and women, or boys and girls, I guess we should call them. Um, they said, in fact, that it's become very popular all over the United States now. When we talk about the Dakota Indians at that time, their ball looked a little bit different. And the uh, stick itself was made of ash or willow. Um, and um, it was really interesting because they played um, often for days. So they might do it like all day and then the next day all day. You know, it was a huge contest. And they kind of, it was really uh, often a gambling thing that was going on where they were trying to, people would win, you know, the team would win different things. And here's a good example. This one was in, in three days when they had, had in Oak Grove, which is now in Bloomington, in 1852, as part of this uh, get together of people. And it said, they said um, there were four local Dakota uh, villages there that came together. Okay, and he said that uh, Gideon Pond, which was the brother of Samuel Pond, who uh, lived in Shakopee, he said he was impressed by the tremendous skill and stamina of the players. And the villages included um, Good Irons, Skyman's, Gray Eagle, uh, uh, Gray Irons, and of course, the band from Little Six here in Shakopee. And guess who won in this? This was a three-day thing. Guess who won? Little Shock. Six. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I was trying to, you know, 
last, you know how it is last minute, I'm looking for pictures. So I just had this sort of says alarming or whatever that is a thing. But I do have a picture somewhere else, but this is women playing it too. So just so you know that it was both men and women back then and even still now. And they did play that here in Jacobi. So that's one of my nieces here playing Ooh. lacrosse. Mm -hmm. The worst part is that I'm, um, I tend to go to a lot of games for all my nieces and nephews who are into sports. But I have no clue how to play. I mean, I know that you go to that thing and that way, you know, how you do it. But I don't know the rest of the stuff, how, you know. But they seem to know, and I just kind of cheer yeah. along. <laughs> so anyway, that's the way it works. I read somewhere, Dave, that, that when the Indians were playing the game, they had a little different name. It was so important that one guy lost and he committed suicide because oh, really? was, yeah, he was so yeah. depressed that his team lost that he... I, I mean, I could imagine because I think it was a big, uh, almost like a yearly competition. They also did it in the winter on the river when it was frozen and they would play lacrosse there also, so just interesting. Um, another one that just kind of ties into from back then is Indian horse racing. And again, it started about 400 years ago. I mention it because they do now have that here in Shakopee too. Um, the horse um, is really a sacred part of the Dakota culture. And they often are referred to as the horse nation. And the horses like to drum, bring people from all walk, walks of life together. And the majestic animals have the power to heal and comfort. Um, but what's really interesting is that we continue on, because I said we do have that. I went to the um, racetrack, and they had it in, in August every year. And it's most interesting, the whole thing. But tied into that is the Faribault family. Remember that Faribault, remember, were um, moved here in 1844. They had a um, cabin and a training post uh, right across from Danger Fields, if you want to think about it that, in terms of location. Although now it's in uh, the landing in Shakopee, but it looks the same. But there's a really interesting story about a, a young girl who ended up being buried under the lilac bush. And the girl, She's actually kind of a teenager. I think she was probably about 13 years old, they think. Um, she rode really fast in uh, there. And what happened though is while she was rowing on the horse, she was looking back to see where the men, where the boys were. She was way ahead. Okay? She was winning because apparently she was like the best, okay? She saw they were ahead and said she was ahead. She gave a smile to him. She continued, and the horse tripped on a gopher hole, and she fell, and she broke her neck, and she died. And it's interesting because the mother of this woman, a girl, I should say, I never noticed a girl as a teenager, 13-year-old, but anyway, she was, um, <coughs> what was interesting about that is that when I ask, people don't remember the name of the, the girl. But they do remember that her mother asked that she would be buried under the lilac trees at the Faribault camp, where in 1858, which is probably two years before then, three people from the Ojibwe um, were buried in the same lilac area. So there's actually four graves that are in the unfairable property downtown. Now the um, Shakti Medawak and Sioux community now has that land, and they will keep it because it's part of um, the history and the, um, the honor of the graves, okay? But it's just interesting because of that, and also the story about um, Eliza, Eliza, which is the daughter of um, Oliver Faribault and Wonky Yonke, okay, and that's her picture. Um, she remembers that, she remembered that the girls had bracelets on her wrists. 
I find it so interesting the little specific things that people remember. Okay, and they said, she remembers that, I know these Indians were buried here because when I was a little girl, my brother and I started to dig into the graves to see if we could find the bracelets. We did not think it was wrong for we were just little children. You aren't supposed to do that, by the way. <laughs> just so you know. Okay. Her grandmother, okay, which was Wakiyaki, caught us digging. And she was so worried that she called the priest because that family was uh, Catholic. Okay? So they called the priest. And he came over and he said, don't worry. They had done no harm. But then a couple of years later, they did it again. Okay? Okay? And again, because they heard that they never found out if someone was really there. And she said, again, the grandmother found us, covered the hole, and she was frightfully upset. And again, she called the priest who comforted grandfather, grandmother. And they all went up to the graves and he said a little prayer. So just an interesting tie into the whole thing, I think. And then it says, then the priest told grandma, he didn't think those Indians mind our digging for them one bit, as long as we were only trying to find out if they were really there. <coughs> Now, the priest felt sure our curiosity was satisfied and we would let them rest in peace. And it's important just to remember that now we have laws in the books that says do not disturb graves, okay? Just to make sure people don't get the wrong idea. And again, the Indian horse races um, happened in August. So far, when I've been there, there have been women involved, but not the main um, Writer, I'm interested to see if that will change more. But it's just interesting. Okay, here's another one of these pictures. This was from 1911 of the basketball team of the high school. I just really just love the picture. <laughs> Look at her eyes here. So smiling. Yeah. <laughs> now we do know that with with uh, older pictures, they tell you not to smile because it taste that when they take the pictures it took a few minutes and if you move it, it changed so you had to keep it the same thing so that's why that's part. but it is still a great picture the problem with this and with all the picture, a lot of pictures that we have we don't know who these people are and we should um, unfortunately we didn't have yearbooks back then the uh, first yearbook I think was in 1953, I think. Oh, wow. Okay. So we have those books, but anything before them we don't have, you know, except they may have pictures like this. Not a lot of them, but what we do. And so on, on your table, you'll see there are some pictures. Mm -hmm. You may or may not know anybody there, but those potential. So I always throw these out. I, these are just ones that we don't know. And after you've looked at them a little bit, then just pass it on to the next group. And we'll just kind of pass it around so everyone has have a chance all the to look. Different? They're yeah, all different. And on the back, there's uh, sticky doubts or whatever. And you can write, if you have a guess of somebody, huh. even if it's wrong, you can do a question mark or whatever. But if you know anything about that, to make a note of that, that would be very helpful. When you say from the right, do you mean from on the right of the picture or from my right? I'm well, looking at it. Left, usually. As, as, as you're looking at it. Left, as they're looking at right. it. As, as you're looking at it. Okay. Okay. Now continue on here because with in terms of history, remember that in 1972 they signed a bill called Title IX which allowed high school girls and collegiate women to compete equally in team sports. So before that time, you could have 10 teams of um, boy sports and no girl sports. Now it had to be equal, okay? And so they started, they were like bad, bad, Badminton, um, other sports like that, was started coming on. It was kind of interesting though, because I was talking to my sister, 
my oldest sister, and she remembers the first letter jacket for girls in Shakopee happened in 1972. And she knows because she was the one who got the first one. <laughs> now why did that happen? She said she was in 10th grade. It was the fall of 1972. And they had the first interscholastic sports. And she lettered in volleyball. She still actually plays volleyball and she still coaches volleyball today. And she's much, much older. But anyway, um, she said at the time, they, the letter jackets were delivered to the athletic director's office. And her, the athletic director was her father, which is my dad too, right? So she would go to pick them up. And because she was the first one to pick it up, she had the first letter jacket. So she's kind of interesting. And that's with her, one of her grandchildren. And we look at sports and look at the pictures that we have, and a lot of them are here, what you have. Some I have, and some we have names on, but mostly we don't. But I just want to show the idea that there were sports going on, mostly with boys. Um, but again, very little um, names of who the people are. We can kind of guess a little bit about time about but we're not sure you know that kind of stuff we're finding something like here's one where this is about our bowling team okay and it just happened that they have on the top middle one is um julius collar the first so we know that we don't know who the other people are but we do know that so that kind of thing is how we find out bit by bit so here's another one of a football where they're really dressed up for this. But this is the Shock B football team in 1909. Wow. And it's just interesting to see the names of the people there. Yeah. Del Wall and Vero, Barrett, Snyderman. Yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. There's some of the names that pop yeah. up. Yeah. Most, most yeah. And most, yes, and most of them play baseball. baseball. In fact, it was very, you know, I remember growing up, my, um, we always did three sports if we did sports. Mm -hmm. Fall, winter, and spring. Three different sports. Today, unfortunately, they want to do one sport throughout the year. I personally believe it's not the best way for, for people, for them to be good for them as a person. But it's the way they do do it now. I do that also. The, the gymnasium. What what gymnasium? Nineteen thirty. So it would probably be the old um, Union School, which was then the Central Elementary, okay. which is um, Fifth and uh, Holmes. Yeah. What year was that changed to Central, you know, added on and made, do you know? Oh, you know, it changed, it changed about six different times. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, once was Central. But I remember it as Central because that's when I was yeah. living next, I was at St. Mary's and we used to go to that Central for <laughs> band. Right. So I would go back and forth, you know. But, so that was at that time. But before then, it was um, first kind of a uh, high school. And then it became K-12, and then it became, um, for quite a while, and then it, when they moved up to high school, then you had, then it was elementary school, and then finally now it's uh, preschool. And here's just, it's just nice to see the picture. We don't know who, we do know this is in Shakopee. We don't even know where this was. You know what I mean? Um, I just kind of like the uniform. Yeah, it's just kind of cool. Yeah. But anyway, it's just interesting. Again, if we could find out that, it would be even better to find that kind of stuff out. But it's just good to see that. So that gives you a little idea about when you talk about sports. And there's many more than that, too. But there's not a lot of pictures back then. But the one area that's most popular that you find information is when you take them out to the ball game, okay? 
and um, um, baseball was probably the most uh, common sports in uh, Shakopee. Um, and well, I do remember this was the, the mayor at this time had forbidden the playing of any exhib exhibition or matches of baseball within the city's limits <laughs> on Sunday. Oh. Well, that happened for a while, but it didn't last very long. All right. But we do know that there were some people <laughs> in town. I think the first uh, uh, ball game that happened were starting in the about 18. 58, 1859, but they were um, nothing, no league or anything, it was just more just play the game kind of thing. It wasn't so much like the back and forth between different teams and stuff like that. But here's the one that's just kind of interesting is William um, Bill Barnes in 1884. He's the first professional ball player who was for, from Shakopee. He was born here in 1858. He played only one season at age 26 for a St. Paul team. There's various names for what it could be, but we know that he played um, with the Union Association. That was the group that would play, get together. But when the Union Association collapsed in 1885, Bill retired from baseball and he spent the rest of his life as a laborer in St. Paul. And there's actually a picture, it's not the best, but it, there's still a picture of him anyway. He was the center fielder. Okay. And this is just going on sites and finding um, in baseball. <laughs> this is the only uh, early uh, picture of someone was that age. Here's another really interesting one. This is the Shotsby Browns was the name of the team. And this was in 1897. But again, look at the names of the people yes. that were there who were playing ball. There's three Veerlings. Yeah, Veerlings. And Reese Rice. Reese 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 must be named after that uh, yeah. lake up there. Yeah. So it's just interesting that who were there at that time. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it's, it's fun to find actual picture from there that actually has some names. Of, names. Yeah. And that was by they put it out, out there for people and people could remember and then they filled in what they could what they could do. Here's another one that's kind of, like, kind of interesting about with baseball. William, uh, Billy Williams played uh, in Shakopee in 1898. And he was also, he was also in Chaska, and that's where his picture was from, because I don't have a picture of him in Shakopee. But it's interesting because he was born um, in 1877, born in St. Paul. Um, after he graduated, he went to uh, a business college, but he was supposedly really a great a semi-pro baseball player. Hmm. What's interesting is at that time, the league uh, said you could not allow African Americans to be in baseball. Hmm. But it still happened yeah. because they found a good person they didn't want to get rid of, so they still would bring them in. So they, there are some there, but at this time in history, it wasn't even allowed, okay? Um, he played for the Chaska White Diamonds um, a Carver team and the Shockby Browns. Um, you know, he was really interesting, and I read, there's a book about him actually, and eventually they asked him to become a, a member of a professional team. But they said he couldn't be labeled as African American. 
They said, well, you could pretend you're Indian. That might be okay. <laughs> that could, which is kind of so strange to me too. Yeah. So, but he said, you know, in the article, the books and a couple articles I've written, he said he just decided, I'm black. That's who I am. Although his mother was white, his father was black. But he just felt, I just need, to, uh, this is the way I'm going to be. So he ended up um, stopping play. Um, it turns out the governor of Minnesota asked him to become a personal assistant. And so he ended up joining. He ended up being through 14 governors. He was the assistant. And he was very well known as welcoming people all the time. So it's just kind of an interesting person. Here's what he looked like when he was older, I think. You know that they gave him, a, um, when he finally departed, the state legislator passed a special act to give him a pension for life. And he died in 1930, 63. 63. He served 14 governors. And he used to be a baseball player in soccer. Mm -hmm. Now the other place that's kind of interesting, of course, is Riverside Park. And I think um, most of you have, have you all been to Riverside Park at some point? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not quite, not you, okay, that's okay, that's all right. All right. Riverside Athletic Park was located on the west side of Highway 169-101, over uh, Home Street Bridge, and then on the left side, okay, on the other side of the river. The first exhibit game was in 1903 against Pryor Lake. And I think we won, was my understanding. I do know that also in the eighth inning, Sullivan drew a base on balls, stole second, third, and home. And William Rice is another one who's really interesting. This was in 1891, but he, he became the manager of the Rock Spring uh, Baseball Club, named after the company. And that was the way, for a lot of people, um, they had some sponsors by different organizations. <coughs> so from 1904 until 1910, the Corals and the Rock Spring team won 97 um, games and last 42 games. And here's the baseball team in 1907. And again, you see who the people are. You got uh, in the background. Where's it? Just like to write. George Veerling. Oh yeah, top. Okay, so that's George Veerling. Okay, Shooty. William Reese, is it Rice? Reese, like the candy bar. I always say that wrong every time. Yeah. Okay. Um, Matt Klinghamer, okay. Oh, Merck's is really Bots cool. Bots huh? Barons. Yeah. The next line there you have um, Hel Peck and Ed Mertz, yeah. and that's a very popular name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. name okay, in the front row you have Joe Witt, um, Harry Behrens and George Sullivan. Mm -hmm. So Sullivan is the one who did the first game also. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of interesting. This is a yes. photo from uh, Dick Mertz, but it's just a good idea to show, again, being able to see who the people are makes it so much nicer. All right, now on your team, if you have your pictures, you might want to move it around to other people. So you, doing it. So you, mm -hmm. Unless you already did. Uh, Riverside Park um, hosted special events. For example, there was a ball game as part of the homecoming celebration in 1919 for the local soldiers back from World War I. Now this picture is not necessarily tied into that. It just was an interesting picture. But do you think that's Holmes Park area? I don't, I'm just, I'm, I'm not because of the building back there. 
they have some nice buildings in, on Home Street there. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah. So Ooh. the grandstand itself was built in 1924. So before then, there wasn't a grandstand. Mm -hmm. This is actually a um, blueprint here of the grandstand. I think I have another one too. Which shows you know, where the stands were, whatever that they did. And I think it's not going to do too. And that was quite the park. I don't, do you all remember that park, those of you who yeah. remember? What color was it? Green. Yeah, I'm just wondering, it was green. It was green. Everybody remembers. I remember that myself. And there's actually, you know, if you go into the uh, Central, which is now the um, Learning Center here in town, which is on 5th and Home Street, there's a mirror that used to be in what used to be the library down there. Okay, and in there, one of them has a picture that shows in the background. There's the oh, yeah. uh, ballpark. Okay, what's interesting is that I was reading uh, some newspapers article. There was one that said there's uh, four separate bids for the grandstand, and A. F. Hutt, Huss, I should Ooh. say, Ooh. 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 I should Ooh. say, was picked to build the stadium for two thousand three hundred ninety-four dollars. And the new grandstand, painted dark green, was built by opening day, which was on Memorial Day of 1924. So Dave, is that mural still up in the yes. old, what was the old Yes, it still room? is. Um, I've been, I haven't come back re real recently, so I'm kind of curious where, what's up with that. But they have left it, I know that. But for a while, parts of it were like, they had an had a air conditioning or something. So, you know, it like kind of somewhat messed up a little bit. But there are pictures of it all the way through. And you actually go on, if, I don't know if you go on computer at all, you can put in um, the WPA um, mural in Shakopee. And they'll actually, it's a whole, they explain who the people are, you know, because there are I've, a lot of people. I've who seen live. that, and yeah. I, it's great. It's really good because it has names of people. It's really nice because it has names of people, too. Yes. And I know some people who were, they're now pretty old, yeah. but, but they remember they were um, people who they, uh, what do you call it, drew, I guess, to put in the, the mm -hmm. people in there. It's also interesting because they talked about uh, a Riverside Park that the wall was about 320 down the left field line, 310 at the right, and the center field was 360 feet from the plate. But this is interesting because remember in the 1970s, so this is going forward a bit again, although this is kind of the past, all right, when Elm Street began dying, remember because of um, Elm disease? So then, that used to be all along the fence there. And when those died, then the sun would come all the time and they'd have to stop playing for a while when the sun was too much so they could play ball. Right? Oh. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of it. Okay. Is everybody, did anybody remember what what do you remember about um, Riverside Park? Oh. Those who remember about mosquitoes. Really? Mosquitoes. Me too. That's what, when somebody uh, was asking uh, me one time, I said, that's the first thing I remember was mosquitoes. And I remember the um, lights that were there. And the mosquito, it was just like covered there. Just, right. I thought it was, in my uh, brothers who played, they were like, oh, it was that was awful. <laughs> so I'm just interested in what you do remember. I mean, I think there's other things you remember too, but that's one big thing that people sure. brings up the most often. They played football yeah. there too. And if, yes, they did. I remember yeah. the 1948 uh, state baseball tournament. People lined up around the fences. I was helping my brother collect bottles. And I, I want to say we got a nickel a case for collecting bottles. I bet you and, got a lot too, didn't you? And uh, we had so many cases of bottles out in left field 
we couldn't get them all turned in and they turned off the lights. <laughs> I, I don't know what happened after that. <laughs> That's so interesting. What a great story. Yeah. Well, somebody owes me 30 cents. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you contact the Shockby Baseball Association? Oh, yes. <laughs> I think my brother Tom. There's a problem with that. You can talk to my brother Gary. He's now he's the Minnesota League person. <laughs> All right. One person that's kind of interesting is Wally Cop. Cop, yeah. right? Okay. Uh -huh. And I know that in the Shockby Argus one time we talked about how he threw a no hit, no run game against uh, St. Bonifacius. Um, and they also, it's interesting what they talk about, he says he's a right-hander thrower, bats from the left, is six feet tall, and weighs 200 pounds. I'm like, I'm so glad they told that information. <laughs> but anyway, after high school, he played in the Class D organization, which is in, in Texas. Um, he caught 100, 105 games, um, hit 334, um, batted 392 times, scored 78 runs, made 103, 131 hits, including 17 doubles and 12 home runs. Three were the baseball field, or was full, uh, grand slam. So it's just kind of interesting the kind of thing they talk about here. Another really interesting oh, one, one is that some of you remember, is Lefty, okay? Um, he was formerly a Cleveland Indian person. He moved to Shakti, and then he ended up managing the teams from 1937 to 44, as well as 46, 48, 57, and 58. His teams won 143 games and lost 75. And here's just kind of interesting picture. He is the second one on the left, this one right here. And he was in with the Cleveland Indians team at the White House in 1921 after the team won the World Series. So this is before he moved to Chicago. Okay, which is kind of interesting. And that's actually a picture from there, which I think they colored. But anyway, um, Warren St Stemmer, from, who was from Shakti, he talked about him. And he said um, that he had pinpoint, pinpoint control, a good curve, a good fastball, not a great fastball. But Lefty had such a terrific changeup that it made his fastball look so much faster. If he needed an out, he would reach back for something extra. <laughs> and Lefty then retired to Shakopee, and he remained active in baseball. And he signed letters to play with the town team in Shakopee, and he settled, um, settled here. He pitched um, through the mid-1930s for Shakopee. Also, and this is the kind of tie-in that happens a lot. You look at uh, Jack Freund, so other people. They often work at the bottling company or RAR, you know, mm -hmm. while they're doing so. In this case, he worked for the uh, bottling company in the Rock Spring, and he also was um, active in civil civic affairs and was in the city council. And he died there uh, following the stroke in 1965. Now, when we talk about Shockby baseball, we talk about the town team, and then we have to talk about the um, high school teams, too. And so we have both going on all the time. Um, the Shockby Indians amateur baseball team was established here in Shakti in 1938. So remember that the first um, baseball playing started in 1858. But you know, this is when they actually had the thing. All right. 
So here's another one that's interesting is Warren Stemmer. Um, he was a, just an interesting person. Um, he attended the high school here. And in that time, he um, won the 1940 state tournament. Then he served in the Army. He signed a professional contract with the uh, um, Braves. But I don't know what happened after that, but I don't think he stayed there. Um, here's a picture of the Shockley team in 1940. Um, and it just, just to see who's there. Um, can mm -hmm. you see what this says on here? You want me to read it up for you? Can, yeah, I'll read it up for you. Um, let me see. Team members E I N A R, Einer Erickson, Lee Wagner, Leon Schult Schwartz, Schwartz, I should say, Art Rathgard, manager Lefty Aldenwaterbulls, um, John. Yeah. Oh. Kep. Kep. Paul Rosen, Perry oh. Ball, Joel Ring, he became uh, mayor, I think, um, George Curver, Warren Stemmer, Frank Almich, Skinny Gazer, Roy Delwo, Charles Kavanaugh, Jess, Jesse Schwartz, and the mascot Jimmy Majeris, yes. Maurice Gorham, Andy Ander, Andrews, and Russ Markway. Okay. So it's just kind of interesting to see that, again, having the names really helps. Yes. So when we have that, it's great. That's what we want to eventually do more. <laughs> now, when we talk about a Warren again, um, he could played um, amateur baseball from 46 to 53. He was the first person to enshrine in the Shockby High School Hall of Fame. And in 2000, the high school basketball team created the Warren Stemmer Class Act Award, which is given each season to the players who embraces the fair play sportsmanship and de dedication to teammates in the game. And they do every year they announce that. And if you go to the high school, the new high school, on the um, south side, I have to look where I, where I would go with that, is the Warren um, Stammer baseball field. Oh, okay. And there's a statue that there are, not a statue, a uh, plaque. plaque that is ready, I think it's, I don't know if it's up yet, but it was getting ready to, they just got it done anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's just good to know about that too. And he was one that I think that a lot of people remember him all the way through, that he was really uh, a good team player. And of course we're talking about the 1940 state champion. Okay. Bucky Cavanaugh, for heaven's sake. You got Bucky, Spike, and Lefty. Lefty, yeah. <laughs> Doctor Huber. Doctor Huber. Yeah, I remember him. I remember he was the dentist, right? That's right. And he smoked while he was working. Yes, I, I think so too. That's so funny. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was yeah, 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 was always full. We went to Jano, Jano, I think. But I do remember that because. Yeah. One of his daughters was in my class. Lucky Kavanaugh and dad. Yes, right. <laughs> and here's what someone mentioned before about uh, 1948. The tournament happened in Riverside Park. It had 34,263 paid admissions and a record-breaking crowd of 7,513 attending the last game. And what's interesting is the new lights were paid for by the ticket sales. Oh, wow. so that's kind of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And here are a few oh, people that are here. There. Oh, I can remember a couple I didn't know were. were yeah. but, that's you, like 11 Yeah. 
I don't know who this person is, though. Yeah, no. Donnelly. Does he die? Donnelly is my cat. Oh, this one about me? Dallas Capacious. These two I don't know of. Yeah, we, there's somebody you don't have listed. Up, upper right, right is this. Is that who that is? Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah, I think so. And Klein. Yeah. yeah. Oh, back this right? Who was it? You're right there. Or here. Upper back. Upper <laughs> Yeah, the, the second row on the right. Right, right there. That's, that's right. Dallas yeah, that's Dallas, 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 Dallas That is. Okay. I'll, I'll add that in and there. And the one on the lower next to Pat, I don't know about. This one I can't add. Yeah. No. So this is just no. last night, so you just you know that's why. I'm sure if I find out, someone probably does know. But um, and here, of course, was when they had the big uh, game. That's where the lower left. Yeah. Yeah. I think Tom. Um, one person I think t talks about how he they used to be in the stands or in the way back it was full. So they just had like a um, line or whatever with a string or whatever. They had to stand in the back there. That <clears throat> and also just an interesting one is this is the longest game in history. Yeah. Here was 1950. Shockby beat St. Peter four to three. In the longest game ever played. <laughs> There's 24 innings. Mm. Wow. Mm. And it took five hours to compete as several fights, <laughs> one including the sheriff and the fire department, prolonged the game. <laughs> 24 innings is, in, in five hours really isn't bad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Most, most of the kids well, there was a lot of zero, 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 zero for a while. Oh, yeah. Oh, they did? They were on the radio, so we knew it was still going. So they actually went home for supper and then came back? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I always have the home at 6 o'clock. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 That's not the best picture anyway. But OK. So when we talk about the, um, the grandstand in Riverside Park, um, in eight, or 1983, the old wooden stands have been declared condemned because of moisture and rotting conditions. And they also, this is my brother told me, my brother Bill was telling me that the snow fence that they had um, would spark yeah. if a wall hit it. And so any ball that hit the fence were considered a ground rule double because nobody wanted to go back and get it. <laughs> <laughs> Later, he said, he found out that the fence stakes had been dropped, driven into a power line. Oh, that's what that's right. Right. <laughs> okay. And Bill Heller, which is my okay. brother's um, friend in the same grade, yep. grade, he said he hit on the last no known round trippers as the ball bounced off the top of the fence and sparks flew through the fence from left field to center field. So just good memory of what you, you know, what people remember about that. And so because of that, and because of the flooding that was going on so much, okay, they decided um, Top Pop Park um, would replace Riverside Park in 1983. Um, my dad um, was a player manager even when he was in high school. He went to uh, uh, Detroit Tigers for one year. He didn't really like it because he said he was there to be a pitcher, which he liked, but he also liked to hit, and they wouldn't let the pitchers hit. And he just met. So anyway, he came back. He eventually moved here to Shockby in 1962. He coached the high school baseball teams, played for the Indian Town teams in the 60s. One season, his average was uh, 542. He managed the team and then president of the Shockby Baseball Stadium um, and Light Commission, I think, from 18, or 1984 to 1998. And it's just interesting because there are some interesting photos when they're actually building place. So they had the, the area 
there, which was a lot on JC, JC's, I think. I had a thing for a minute. Is that was JC's, right? Uh, sounds right. Yeah, that's I think nice. that's correct. Um, but there are just some interesting pictures of them actually doing some of the work back then when they actually um, put up the grandstand. And remember, they used um, the chairs from Metropolitan yes. Stadium. Mm -hmm. And then more recently, from Metrodome. Metrodome. So they replaced it again a second time. Is my brother pretending like he's working? <laughs> and here he's trying again one more time. I just make fun. Of he actually is quite good at that kind of stuff. That's his thing. And it's just, you know, in terms of just wheeling that up. And then you look at what the stadium actually looks like now. And after my dad died, then they um, named the stadium after him. So it's the Joe Schlepper Stadium. But what's interesting, something a good trivia thing is, he actually has two stadiums named after him. Okay. When he was uh, in high school and afterwards, he and his four of his brothers, the five of them, were baseball players. Um, Joe was the youngest, obviously, of these are five. There are nine in the family, actually. Two older um, boys were out working right away. But the rest of them played ball all the south of the time. And in farming, now they have the um, Schlepper Brothers Field. And, and where was it? In farming, Minnesota, which is near Albany, farming. Minnesota. Uh, yeah, that's probably the closest. You know where Al Albany? There's a little town, very small, cow farming. Oh. Huh. I didn't see that. <coughs> and then just to know that today, sports have many options as one option that you can do in um, if you're interested in sports. And so just kind of interesting because I was looking through um, and finding out, for example, in fall sports that's, that are, are available for people now, Adapted sock, soccer, cheerleading, football, girls swimming and diving, performance dance, boys soccer, girls cross country, girls soccer, girls tennis, volleyball. And you know, so you see how they're always have to make sure there's an equal amount all the time, no matter what they're doing. And that's part of the thing. So that way, as many ways, it works very well because then a lot more people are able to do sports, whatever, if they're interested in. I know now that I think the volleyball, they're going to do a, this is girls actually, and I think they're going to do, they've done it, I think it's a club team, I think it's going to become a, a regular um, this, boys team. And spring. And um, see, I take the pictures of all my nieces and nephews. <laughs> all right, so winter sports, um, basketball, swimming and diving, girls basketball, wrestling, boys hockey, dance, girls hockey. I always wondered, because see, this is me, my vision. I was like, okay, suppose I wanted to be a wrestler and you're a girl. Can you do it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I believe by law they have to. I but think, anyway, I just, I, I was I curious. Do I don't know that anybody wants to, but it just, you know. But I think it's, it's yes, I know it's been done in other places, so it's just interesting. Um, and then spring sports. You know, the adopted softball, that's of course people who have disabilities who also are, can be involved. Just, you know, is that what they're talking about? Okay. And there's a schlepper one. There's another Joey. It's Joey. Uh -huh. And also, there are a lot of club uh, teams here um, in the high school. So there's like bowling club. Uh, boys volleyball, which is going to become a, a regular sport, climbing crew, fishing club, mountain bike club, the Shakopee Urban Dance Squad, 
<laughs> and the Trap Club. I, for me, like I was like looking through this stuff the other, yesterday when it's through, like, well, this is so interesting. I love to go to some of these. I don't. I've never seen some of these things, We've heard, and it would be interesting to see. I've heard that trapping club is just too capacity. That's my understanding too. That it's very popular, and, and that's girls and boys. Yeah, oh, that's and I've seen. Yeah, I, I have seen pictures on online too, and it looks huge. Mm -hmm. it's so it's just interesting, but too, you know. But even like fishing club is just it's just interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's a great thing. As it, again, having more options for people if they want to. And to me, if they're doing something, I remember growing up with my dad. And I, my brothers and sisters were great in sports, right? I wasn't. Believe me. I remember playing for a while, but it wasn't worth the time to do so. But I do remember that my dad was like, you know, what's important is you need to do something. You can't just sit around and you can't, you know. And I just remember, it's so okay, I can do other things, you know, so did I think. And I like that, but I think what is important is that if people have more options, then they're more likely not being on the streets. Yeah. <laughs> and that's Absolutely. what you kind of want, you know. I think that's why even this place is an important place to have for people to have it. I thought yes. that Sudski was a drinking club. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. When I first saw it, when it first had it, I had to go into it because that's all it says in Sudski. I'm like, what? I don't know they allowed that. Yeah. I enjoy that. We, uh, we had you, you mentioned involved. We had a neighbor with three boys involved in everything. Dad said they didn't have time to get in trouble. Yeah, I mean, that's really, I know that's why my parents were doing it. They had to, otherwise they'd be in trouble. But, they were anyway, but you know, not as bad. <laughs> but now, now everybody is involved in something, and consequently, people are looking for summer help that they can't get because they're involved. Yes. Get so yeah. that is the other thing too. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that too. But you know, I I do think, and I know there's a lot of people that don't go do anything. But I'm hoping that every um, student is able to do something that they're interested in. It's not necessarily, it could be uh, drama, it could be, you know, there's a lot of different clubs. They have a lot know. of those programs also. So, yeah. So, it's just, but it's just kind of interesting to see that. Do you have a question or no? Okay. And finally, just so you know, coming up, I'm doing Home Sweet Home about dwellings in early Shakti at the library on December 8th. And back here on December 11th, Tuesday, uh, 1 to 2, and that would be about um, the ferries, the drownings that happened in Shakopee, uh, things that happen on the river. Okay? So just so you know that. All right. Any other questions here at the end? No. Thanks again for coming. It was always good to see you guys. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And if anybody wants to buy that over there, you just let me know because I have to fill out a form or I'll get in trouble. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait. Who has the little paper things? The little what? The paper, the little papers that we had of pictures of people. Oh, they're oh, all, a oh, bunch of them are here. All right, well, just someone has the one that has in the back of a uh, round uh, colored thing. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah, you can this one. Uh, oh, all right, thank you. Somebody phone me.